We're continuing tonight again in the second coming of Christ. One of the great pillars of the apostolic doctrine. Jesus, before he left the earth, he reminded his disciples, I will come again. And as he ascended up into heaven, one of the, the holy angel told him, that He shall come in like manner as you have seen him go. Mm -hmm. We've associated the coming of Christ with his with him coming in all of his glory, which will spell the end of the world as we now know it. Scriptures say it this way in Revelation 21, that before from before his face the heavens and earth fled away and there was no place found for them. So earth cannot endure the full glory of God Amen. when of Christ, much less all the glory of Jesus, all the glory of the Father, and all the glory of the holy angels, which, which the Gospel writers tell us will attend Christ's coming. His coming is associated with the completion of the church. All who say to be gathered to Him ever be with the Lord. His coming is associated with the destruction of all foes, who He will destroy with the brightness of His coming. And we've uh, commented on it's associated with the resurrection of the dead. That in the day of the Lord, He'll raise the dead when He comes again. All of them. Now I want to deal tonight with the judgment of the righteous and the wicked. <coughs> together. At the coming of the Lord. Judgment in relation to the coming of Christ. That's going to be our ultimate focus. Now let's deal first of all with the reality of the judgment. This is something that's not spoken of much these days. These days of the mega church and popularity and praise movements and so forth. You do not hear very much about the judgment day, but there is a considerable amount said about it in Scripture. Because if a person's not ready for the judgment day, they won't pass through it. Mm -hmm. The judgment day. Actually, it was revealed in the spiritually primitive times when there wasn't much known about eternity. You know, the men of great men of God of old time didn't speak much about eternity. Mm -hmm. Solomon, he never did say anything about something eternal. Mm -hmm. in all of his wisdom, that was an area he wasn't given wisdom in. And Moses, he didn't talk much about eternity. The psalmist, he mentioned it, but you said his son it was kind of vague. There wasn't a lot said about eternity. But here and there, here and there it was leaked out that there's a, particularly a judgment which is connected with eternity. <coughs> the judgment day is connected with eternity, not with time. The judgment day is not going to occur in time, it's going to occur after time. Take, for instance, the statement made in 1 Chronicles 16.33, and it's quoted in, Psalms 90, in Psalm 96.13. Then shall the trees of the wood sing out of the presence of the Lord, because He cometh to judge the earth. Mm -hmm. Psalm 96.13 says, Before the Lord, for He cometh. He cometh to judge the earth. He shall judge the world with righteousness and the people with his truth. It's notice it's connected with his coming. That's the point that I want to make here. Even Solomon knew that this is sort of a reasoning process. He knew that men were going to be judged for what they did. Ecclesiastes 3.17 I said in my heart, God shall judge the righteous and the wicked, for there is a time, there is... There is a time there for every purpose and for every work. He knew. Ecclesiastes 12, 14, God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. See, he concluded, once you're convinced that God is who God says he is, once you're convinced that man was made by God and is accountable to him, you know, whether you know the Bible says it or not, you know that man's going to be accountable to God. There's got to be a day of judgment. There's got to be one. Men are getting by with too much. There's got to be one. Solomon knew there was. Daniel, he was given to see it, just a brief glimpse. But he saw it. Daniel 7, 10. 
A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousand thousands ministered unto him. And ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. And the judgment was set. And the books were opened. So he saw this. This is on the schedule. And as time progressed, Jesus talked more about this. The apostles took up their frame and they talked about this. They held this always before the people. It's not over yet. If it looks like people are getting by, they're not getting by. There's a day of judgment coming. Now the, uh, both the righteous and the unrighteous are going to be judged. Some people say, well, the righteous won't be judged. They'll just be rewarded. They'll, be a, they'll come before the Lord. This is taught now. They'll come before the Lord and they'll, be, they'll get various levels of reward. But they really won't be judged. Well, this is, this is just not true. Here's, how, here's what the Holy Spirit said. Romans 14, 10. He said that uh, we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Mm -hmm. Amen. We surely will. Let me remind you of what Jesus said about the judgment. Verily I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. That city was the one that didn't receive it. Mm -hmm. See, before Jesus, when Jesus went out preaching, he'd send people before him to announce he was coming. Some cities didn't want him to come. He said, it'll actually be better off. That Sodom and Gomorrah will, will be better off than cities like that. What, a, what about our time? What about our time, brother? When the Son of God is not only walking among men, He's been exalted to the right hand of God, and God's told us that He is, and the Gospel's gone out, saying, whosoever will may come. What do you suppose is going to be the lot of someone who rejects this salvation? Well, it'll be better for Sodom and Gomorrah. Okay, and that's about the worst case you can think of, of Sodom and Gomorrah. It'd be better. Mm -hmm. It would have been better to die in the holocaust of Sodom and Gomorrah than to face the living God having not responded to his gospel. Mm -hmm. It'd be better. Again, Jesus speaks. Matthew eleven twenty two. I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon at the day of judgment. See, I pointed out the day of judgment been spoken of. Matthew 12, 36, I say unto you that every idle word men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. So this is a very uh, common thread. The apostles picked this up. They talked about a day of judgment to some Athenians who held to various philosophies and were not acquainted with the Bible or Moses and the prophets or the gospel. Paul said to them, God had appointed a day, a day, in the which he would judge the world mm -hmm. in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he has given assurance unto all men, in that he hath raised him from the dead. So Jesus, of course, Paul preached, you know, there in Athens, the resurrection of the dead, which began with Jesus. If Jesus is raised from the dead, that you don't have any other, need any other proof than that. Mm -hmm. He's going to judge the world. Yes. That's what that God said. He's, a, he's given assurance to all men. A man's going to judge the world. Acts 24, 25. Paul is reasoning with Felix. Now notice what he reasoned with him about. And he reasoned of righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come. Mm -hmm. I'm going to wax bold and say, I would venture to say some of us outside of our immediate circle of friends have probably never in their lifetime heard a person reason about righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come. Do some heavy thinking and see when last you heard some kind of reasoning like this. This is how the apostles reasoned. Righteousness, that's godliness, holiness, perfecting holiness, being upright, temperance, Self-control, keeping away from sin, subduing your body, bringing it into subjection, and judgment to come. And he reads it, it, it frightened Felix. He said, well, let me, I'll call for you in a more convenient season. Just. But, but he didn't. He trembled, Scripture says, when Paul reasoned. How about Hebrews 6, 2? The judgment is actually a foundation stone. Whoever... 
this is like a fundamental, a basic elementary school. Because of the, doc, the principles of the doctrine, including the doctrine of baptism and laying of hands and the resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment. These are like foundations. Like if a person hasn't heard about these things, they haven't been taught correctly. Hebrews 9.27 is appointed that a man wants to die and after that the judgment. Mm -hmm. It's taught in Scripture quite consistently. <clears throat> now the Scripture tells us there's like it's one judgment day. There's not two, three, four judgment, one judgment day. Mm -hmm. It is true there have been various judgments here on during time. Mm -hmm. But the judgment day is one judgment. Judgment. It isn't one judgment for saints and, and sometime later another one for sinners. I'm sorry, but Hal Lindsey and all this crowd are just wrong in saying that. Mm -hmm. They're just not right in saying this at all. 2 Corinthians 5.10 We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that everyone mm -hmm. may receive of the things done in the body according to he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Mm -hmm. Everyone. One seat, one judgment. Again, Hebrews 10 and verse 30. We know him who that has said, Vengeance belongs to me, I will recompense, saith the Lord. Again, the, George, the Lord shall judge his people. It is, it is going to happen. The judgment of his people and of, the, uh, and of all men. God said of the angels that fell, he said, he's able to reserve them unto the judgment day. Mm -hmm. One. You'll never read judgment days. The kind of language is not in the scripture at all. The scriptures talk about us being bold in the day of judgment. Mm -hmm. First John 4, 17. And God knows how to reserve the unjust to the day of judgment. 1 Peter 2.9. So there are several places in Scripture that speak about, about this. As I mentioned, the, the righteous will be, will be judged. We must all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Paul reasons this way, to the godly. We're talking about the godly now. Why dost thou judge thy brother? Mm -hmm. Why dost thou set at naught thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. <laughs> So he's not talking about rewards there. <clears throat> Again, 2 Corinthians 5.10, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Hebrews 10.30, the Lord shall judge His people. Mm -hmm. The righteous are going to be judged. And we're told to live in anticipation of it. Of course, the wicked are going to be judged too. For instance, the Word of God says the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptation and to reserve the unjust under the day of judgment. So God knows how to do this. Even though it looks like they're getting by. Looks like they're kind of getting by with everything. But they're not. Again the scriptures tell us in Jude 1, 14 and 15. Said that Enoch the seventh from Adam prophesied of these saying. Behold the Lord cometh with ten thousand of his saints to execute judgment upon all. And to convince all that live ungodly among them of their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. So this is the ungodly are going to be judged. Mm -hmm. They are. Now the, the point that I really want to make here is that this this does need to be preached. This, this does need to be said. Amen. Not just a, a hope that people will stumble across it in the Bible somewhere. This is like a, a deterrent to ungodliness. It's pretty hard to sin while you're thinking of the day of judgment, let me tell you. Mm -hmm. that if you have, there are things you wonder whether you should be doing or not. If you just ask yourself, do I want to stand before God and give an account for this in the day of judgment? I can guarantee you every single time you'll know the answer. You will never be in doubt about it. It's like an impregnable test. Do I want to account for this? Like, what explanation will I really give to God? It'll, it'll stop you from doing a lot of things. <laughs> and it will provoke you to do some other things. <clears throat> and the judgment of the righteous and wicked will be together. John the Baptist put it this way. 
of Jesus, he said, whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor mm -hmm. and gather the wheat into the garner, but he will burn up the chaff with unquestionable fire. Those aren't two different phases. Mm -hmm. He's going to clean the floor. <clears throat> that is the area where people were being readied. The area of time. He's going to clean the floor. Nothing's going to be left on the floor. Mm -hmm. It's the idea. He's going to take the wheat, gather into his barn, burn up the yes. chaff. There'll be no further need for, quote, the floor. Mm -hmm. <laughs> or the field. Mm -hmm. The field is the world. There'll be no further need for the field. The field will be reaped. The wheat taken in, tares gathered out, or if you look at the chaff, burneth unquenchable fire. Judgment at the same time. Revelation 22 <clears throat> and verse 12 the Lord says, Behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. Now, is there anyone that thinks that that means only the, only the Christian or only the ungodly? It means exactly what he said. Every man. When's that going to occur? When he comes. Amen. It's very plain. There's no need for any ambiguity about this. There's no, there's no need for anyone to be in confusion about this. What's going to happen when Jesus comes? Every man's going to be rewarded. Does it make any difference whether they did good or whether they did evil? It doesn't make any difference. Every man. Here's another statement of it. Acts 10, 42. <laughs> he commanded us to preach unto the people. Ooh, I'm interested in this. And I dedicate this to all great commissioned people <laughs> who never make reference to this. I dedicate this to them. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that it is he who was ordained of God to be the judge of the quick and the dead. The quick means living. Mm -hmm. How many of the living? <laughs> All of them. Mm -hmm. How many of the dead? All of them. Jesus commanded. Mm -hmm. You'll never hear a great commissioned person quote this text. Mm -hmm. You can live from now. You lived as long as Methuselah. For 969 years, you'd never hear one of these people quote this. But Peter said, this is what he commanded us to preach. Mm -hmm. He told us, tell the people that Jesus is going to judge everybody, the quick and the dead. Mm -hmm. So it needs to be preached. I don't know where, where this fell out, and people forgot about it, but it's time to restore it. Mm -hmm. Here's the same thing, 2 Timothy 4.1. I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing. Jesus is very, very plain. Here it is again, 1 Peter 4.5. Who shall give account to him that is ready to judge the quick and the dead. See that? In other words, quick and dead, everybody's in, in those categories. There isn't any mortal that's not in those categories. Either quick or living, or dead. You can only get two ways. You can be those that are alive to God, and those that are dead to God. All of them. Or you can view those that are died in the grave, and those that are alive when Jesus comes. All of them. So you, either way, you get it all. He's the judge of the quick and the dead. And Jesus said, preach this to the people. Mm -hmm. Tell the people this. Why? It'll make for sobriety. There won't be so much giddy-headedness and people won't be having so much fun hmm? if they know this. And remember, even the psalmist knew he's coming to judge the earth. He, <coughs> even the psalmist knew this back in those primitive times. He knew that he's coming to judge the earth. So he's going to, the righteous are going to be judged, the wicked are going to be judged, and they're all going to be judged together. There's one day of judgment. These are just very obvious from Scripture. <clears throat> I want to note here also some things pertinent to the judgment, things that will occur at the judgment. <clears throat> Jesus said this in Matthew 16, 27, The Son of Man shall come <clears throat> in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he shall reward every man <clears throat> according to his works. That's the way it's going to be. Mm -hmm. Now, people can theorize about where, what role works play, and you can banter back and forth about, well, how important are works, and what if you don't do works? And, but after all said and done, mm -hmm. Jesus said, this is in the red print, 
He's going to judge men according to their works. So whatever your works are, it's going to have something to do with where you spend eternity. Let's say it again. Matthew 12, verse 36. Now I'm talking about things that will occur in the day of judgment. I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. Now, we live in a time of loose speech. Language has been dumbed down to where it sounds like idiot talk, almost all of it. Particularly in the entertainment media, people don't know what the other guy is saying. It's almost like we've duplicated Babel again. And people just babble, and they don't think what they're saying. Speak idle words. Idle words mean words, empty words. They don't really mean anything. They don't convey any real thought. They don't, they don't stimulate thinking at all. See, said every idle word, men's going to explain to Christ why they said it. Mm -hmm. Why did you say that? Well, I wasn't thinking. You think that's <laughs> that isn't going to fly? I'm, I'm sorry. Every idle word. What a generation we have that needs to hear that. Again, Romans 14, 12. So then, every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. Now here in this world, <clears throat> if you're parents, sometimes you account for your family. Hmm? Uh, maybe if you belong to a congregation, you may make an attempt to account for some of the members and explain to people why things are the way they are. Or maybe you have parents and they're older and you'll account, well, this is, a, this is why they're the way they are. But see, in that day, we'll give account of ourselves. Mm -hmm. And it's going to, uh, you're going to give account to the one who knows it all already. Yes. So this isn't yes. for information purposes. Yes. This isn't so God will know really what you're like. He already knows. You're just going to acknowledge before an assembled universe that God's assessment was precisely correct. Every one of us. Things pertinent judgment. Here's another thing. Romans 2.14 In that day when the God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ uh, according to my gospel. This is the stuff I preach. Mm -hmm. says, this is the stuff I preach. God's going to judge the secrets mm -hmm. of men by Christ. And that's what I preach. Well, again, I asked the question, when was the last time you heard somebody preach that? Whenever you did, that was the time you didn't hear the, at least a segment of the gospel. Mm -hmm. You'll judge the secrets of mankind. Now, here's another thing will occur the judgment. I'm showing what a detail. See what a detail is here in the day of judgment. It's going to occur when Jesus comes. Nothing's going to be hidden at all. So if anything's got to be what they call outed or brought out into the open, this is the time to do it. <laughs> Not then. Everything is going to come out into the open, but this is the time to do it. And if you wonder, is there something I need to come out, just say, search me and try me and see if there'd be any wicked way in me. Just That's, that's the time to settle that. Here's 1 Corinthians 4 5. Here's something else, the day of judgment. Just not even for the time until the Lord come. Who both will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will make manifest the counsels of the heart. Yeah. How did people think? Why did they do what they did? Why was their thinking skewed? God's going to make it known. We're going to find there's a reason for everything. Mm -hmm. Nobody sinned without a reason. Nobody did righteousness without a reason. Both folk didn't sin that didn't want to. Folk didn't do righteousness that didn't want to. It's going to show the counsels of the heart. See how the detail there is. Romans 3, 4 gives another little facet of the day of judgment. Let God be true, but every man a liar as it is written, that thou mightest be justified in thy sayings, and mightest overcome when thou art judged. What does he mean? In this world, men are prone to judge God. So the things say things like, well, that's not what he, God meant when he said that. Mm -hmm. Or they'll say, well, it doesn't make any difference. That was written for another time. Or they will say, well, I don't care what the Bible says. Mm -hmm. They'll be, 
God's going to be overcome. And that day is going to be evident. God was true, and everybody that wasn't in agreement with him was a liar. Just yes. cut, cut and dry. Now, in, in redemption, see, this matter is addressed in redemption to bring us into accord with God. The day of judgment, God will be justified. Here's another thing the day of judgment will happen. Henceforth, this is 2 Timothy 4 8. Henceforth, there is laid up for me. A crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give to me in that day. And not to me only, but to all them that love is appearing. So here's something going to occur at the day of judgment. Is those that have done well, run a good race, fought a good fight, are going to be publicly given a crown of righteousness by the Lord, the righteous judge. He's going to do it. So you see the day of judgment is rather complex. Here's another thing. The day of judgment, judgment's going to be discreet. Every, it's not going to be the same for everybody. Mm -hmm. And Jesus gave a hint at the, of this in Luke 12, 46. Notice he's talking about himself returning. The Lord of that servant will come in a day when he looketh not for him. And at an hour when he's not aware, and will cut him in sunder, and will appoint him his portion with the unbelievers. And that servant, which knew his Lord's will, and prepared not himself, neither did according to his will, will be beaten with many stripes. Mm -hmm. But he that knew not, and did commit things worthy of stripes, shall be beaten with few stripes. For unto whomsoever much is given of him, so much be required, and of whom men have committed much of him also, they will ask the more. So see, his judgment is going to be discreet. Whoever has received a lot from the Lord, God's going to expect a lot back. Mm -hmm. yes. And if it doesn't, a lot doesn't come back, many stripes. Mm -hmm. So here, I guess, if I'm thinking after the manner of men, would be what appears to be a disadvantage by being in an assembly where you're heard more than the average person hears. Some people might say, well, it's, in a sense, there's a disadvantage to this. No, there really isn't. Because God considers people to have received something when God puts it within their reach. Mm -hmm. When God makes things available to people, He has in fact given them much. Look at it this way. Our entire generation has been given much as compared to the time of Adam and Eve, yes. or Noah, or Abraham, or David. See, they've been given much. And much is expected Amen. out of this generation that's living in the day of salvation. Much is expected of them. We know that this is the case because God has strategically placed every person in the world. Mm -hmm. Acts 17.26 says that he determined the precise times and the exact places where people would live that they might seek him, feel after him, and find him, though he'd be not far from every one of us. So everybody, including people in Joplin, everybody has been strategically placed to give them an advantage to seek God. And we're living in a generation that has received more than previous ages before Christ. It's much more. So it's going to be a discreet judgment according to what you had accessible to you. Mm -hmm. There are some things that are pertinent to the day of judgment. Remember them. Rewarded according to works. So we all best be doing something. Every idle word, give an account of it. Give account of ourself, secrets judged, counsels of the heart made known, God justified in all of his sayings, it was clear that he was right, crown of righteousness given to the faithful, and judgment on a discreet basis, some receiving many stripes and some receiving few. I can't imagine that taking place in just a very brief, mm -hmm. brief period of time. Now, as I have said, all of this is associated with Christ's coming. 
The psalmist in Psalm 96, 13, as we've already stated, I want to correlate these psalms with a statement that Paul made in Athens. Before the Lord he cometh, he cometh to judge the earth. He shall judge the world with righteousness. Mm -hmm. That is with a righteous standard. Is the idea. Mm -hmm. Psalm 98, 9 says the same thing. He cometh to judge the earth with righteousness. Mm -hmm. Shall he judge the world and the people with equity. Many strife to some, few stripes to others. See? Now Paul refers to this precise, <coughs> this precise psalm in Acts 17.31. He hath appointed a day in the which he would judge the world in righteousness. See? Exactly what the psalmist said. By that man. That is a man who's going to judge men. Mm -hmm. The man, Christ Jesus, is going to... So we, we're, we'll have the, as much mercy as is possible. Amen. Because one of our own will, will judge us. <laughs> then, when Jesus comes, everyone's going to be rewarded. Matthew 16, 27. The Son of Man shall come in the glory of His Father with His angels, and then shall He reward every man according to His works. Now whether you read about it in Greek or English or however you read it, that's pretty, pretty clear what that is. It doesn't sound like secret to me. You can't do something to every man and it be secret. Revelation 22, 12. Behold, I come quickly, my reward's with me. To give every man according as his work shall be. Remember my postulate is that the judgment is going to occur when Jesus comes. That's when it's going to happen. Matthew 25, 19. After a long time, the Lord of those servants cometh and reckoneth with them. That's, that's judge, talking about judgment. He's going to face everybody. When he comes again, it's just not going to be just like a sign in the sky and it's all going to be over. It's not going to be quite like that. He's going to come and he's going to confront everybody individually as well as collectively. There'll be whole generations confronted, like the whole generation of in Jesus' day of Jerusalem will be compared to Sodom and Gomorrah and the Queen of Sheba and the people of Nineveh. There'll be whole generations, whole nations, whole ages, and individuals I'm going, to, I'm going to face face up to that. Then when Jesus comes, he's going to separate sheep from the goats. He's going to deal with both of them. Matthew 25, 31. The Son of Man shall come in his glory, and all his angels with him. And then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. And before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divided the sheep from the goats. That's that's pretty plain. He's not going to be sitting on the throne of glory for you to go visit him. <laughs> this isn't going to be it. You're going to be gathered before him. There ain't anybody going to take a plane and go over there to see Jesus. Amen. All the nations are going to be before him and then, let me remind you what it says when he comes in his glory, then he'll separate. Mm -hmm. And it'll be an eternal separation. Mm -hmm. Depart from me. He'll say, you workers of iniquity, into everlasting fire. To the others, he'll say, enter into the joy of the Lord. That's when he comes. Now, here's something else. When he comes, I'm judgment, when he comes. Mark 8, 38. Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when, when, he comes in the glory of his Father with his holy angels. That's when. Mm -hmm. hmm. So see that that not only is are the people who served him going to be glorified, but the others, Jesus is going to be ashamed of them when mm -hmm. he comes Amen. in the glory of his Father with his angels. That's kind of a uh, that's kind of a frightening word for if a person is living at a distance from God. <laughs> If a person has lived in a faithless and adulterous generation, and methinks that is the kind of generation we're living in, yes. a generation that's not noted for faith, that departs from God and, uh, and prostitutes its affection for God by giving it to others, if a person in that kind of generation, if a person shuts their mouth, doesn't live for God, looks like the world, 
acts like the world, just note this down in your conscience. Jesus will be ashamed of a person like that. Amen. And you don't want that when Jesus comes. There isn't anything good going to follow after that for such a person. I actually think that gospel being preached today that people can't imagine Jesus being ashamed of anybody. Yeah. They just kind of present this kind of sympathetic, doting old grandfather type Jesus that isn't ashamed, but he thought he's gone on record. Mm -hmm. If you're living in an age that it's hard to be godly in, and you and you kind of blend in with it, oh, you are it, this uh, coming of the Lord will be a tragic day. So I, I encourage everyone to. Uh, Stand up and speak up, and if people don't like it, just say it anyway. Mm -hmm. Do it anyway. Don't be ashamed of it. And again, here's uh, everyone will be that has lived for God faithfully will be praised mm -hmm. by Jesus when He comes. This is First Corinthians four five. Therefore, judge nothing before the time until the Lord come. Who both will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will make manifest of the counsels of the heart, and then shall every man have praise from God. So there may be some thinking that Jesus is going to come and sneak the church out. Well, this, this doesn't sound good to me after I read this. Then shall every man have praise from God. That sounds more like a public matter than a private matter to me. Uh -huh. And again, here now, here's a very straightforward statement about Jesus judging the world. 2 Timothy 4.1 I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at His appearing. Just, how can anybody not see that? I mean, it's very plain. When Jesus appears, it's over. Yeah. And judgment is at the doorstep. And Jude quotes Enoch, who was probably talking about the flood specifically, but it applies to the second coming of Christ too. And he says that he associates the coming of the Lord with judgment. This is Jude 14 and 15. Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousand of his saints to execute judgment. Uh, in the flood, it was uh, it was a temporary judgment from which the world recouped. But when Jesus comes, it won't it won't recoup. Well, nowhere in Scripture is there ever is it ever said that a moral or spiritual change takes place after Jesus comes. Mm -hmm. Now you'll have to, there just isn't any, of, and, but don't take my word for it, search and see if these things aren't so. See if a moral or a spiritual change, that, or shall we say regeneration. Regeneration does not occur after Jesus comes. It's the judgment that occurs after Jesus comes. Nowhere is there a, depicted as a battle against Jesus taking place after he comes. Now, there are some people who are sex of Scripture that they kind of try and twist to mean this. But Jesus, we are told he'll destroy his ark foe, who is Satan. And when Satan is destroyed, everybody under Satan goes down too. Yes. Amen. And he said, going to destroy with the breath of his mouth and the brightness of his coming. So it categorically says this. Also, in Revelation, the... 20th chapter, verses 11 through 15, where he depicts the judgment. It is said that Satan, the false prophet, and the beast were thrown into the lake of fire before this began. Mm -hmm. Revelation 20, verse 8. Before, Satan's taken out of the way before mm -hmm. the day of judgment. The day of judgment. <laughs> it's when Jesus appears. It's here, and, and Satan's, Satan's heyday is over. Mm -hmm. at that time and the day of the saints is about to begin Amen. when that comes so the day of judgment of the righteous and the wicked is going to take place when the Lord Jesus comes